Hello there, this is a video about Stefan Molyneux, and in particular his video, The Truth About the Fall of Rome, Modern Parallels. Now his video is two and a half hours long, but I decided to take a look at it anyway, for two main reasons. Firstly, I love talking about Rome, I'm a big Roman history fan, and secondly, a particular pet peeve of mine is people cherry picking from Roman history, and ancient history in general, to support some modern ideology. Not that I'm suggesting we should ignore history, or that there are no specific parallels between the ancient world and the modern, because I think there are plenty of legitimate points of comparison. Nor do I have any problem in particular with historical revisionism, if it's done for the right reasons. If you find new evidence to support or disprove some facet of current historical knowledge, excellent, revise history. Now what bothers me is people who approach history with a specific modern political agenda, and oh boy, does Stefan Molyneux have a political agenda. Now there's plenty of things that are gonna go wrong when you try to apply contemporary political leanings to the ancient world. You will end up missing things out that contradict your bias, and overemphasizing certain things that support it. And you might end up being guilty of what Aldous Huxley would call temporal oversimplification and compressing or stretching the timeline to suit your narrative, and this is of particular note when we're talking about Roman history. Ancient Roman civilization existed in so many forms and for so long that there's more than enough evidence to support any sort of modern political leaning, that is, as long as you're very selective about it. Rome was at times a kingdom, a republic, an empire, first a city-state that grew to control the Italian peninsula, and then the whole of the Mediterranean. And it existed for an enormous length of time, it was a republic for about 500 years, the western empire fell after another 500 years, and the eastern half of the empire lasted for another thousand after that. And actually, something to keep in mind going forward, is that the entire history of the United States of America, from the Declaration of Independence to today, can fit neatly inside just what is considered the decline period of the Western Roman Empire. Trying to condense this wealth of history and apply it to just the last few decades of modern politics in the West is, well, difficult to say the least. And I'm mentioning all this now because Stefan Molyneux, bless him, does all of this in his video. He's gonna take his square peg views and try to hammer them into the round hole of Roman history. For two and a half hours. Uh, but what are Stefan's views, you might be wondering? Well, for the uninitiated, he's anti-state, anti-taxes, pro-free market, and in particular, he doesn't much like women, to put it lightly. And he applies this thinking relentlessly to basically everything all the time, and before we get to Rome actually, I've invented a game called What is Stefan Molyneux Talking About? And I'm going to show you some clips, and you have to try and guess the subject of the video that the clip came from. For men, an attack from the males of another tribe was the greatest evil. If the men of tribe B attack and conquer tribe A, the men of tribe A would generally be killed off or enslaved along with their descendants, thus effectively ending the transmission of their genes. The women, however, would usually be taken as spoils of war, which would allow the continuation of their genetics. Thus men are conditioned by evolution to guard the tribal perimeters and fight to the death. That's from his video about Zootopia. <laughs> uh, next clip. Feminists portray men as evil and patriarchal in order to provoke the white knight PROTECT THE EGGS! response that actually characterizes historical masculinity, while single mothers have to pretend that all men are shiftless and irresponsible, otherwise they themselves will be blamed by their children who are forced to grow up poor and fatherless. Almost always the same thing, because their mother chose to mate with a bad man, or drove away a good man, which is even worse. And that's from his video about Star Wars The Force Awakens. Yeah, the last one now. Young men are worth substantially less in the sexual marketplace than young women because young men do not have a lot of resources to provide to pregnant, pregnant and child-raising women. 
while young women have a decade or two of fertility ahead of them. Young women so often mistake their sexual appeal for personal value, since it is infinitely easier to giggle and surf the tsunami of male desires than it is to struggle for a life of virtue and meaning. And that's from his video about the movie Frozen. And if you watched Frozen and came away talking about human fertilization and the sexual marketplace, well, you know, you definitely took a wrong turn somewhere. Now, I can't tell if Stefan is actually sitting there watching children's movies and genuinely getting all exasperated, or if he just views these recent popular movies as good vehicles for him to get his ideology to a wider audience. And it's tempting to just talk about Stefan on movies, to be honest, but we're here for ancient Rome right now. We'll save the movies for another day. So let's get to it. Because this is about saving Western civilization. We look deep into the past so that we can control the future. And your past has been so falsified to you, so lied about. You know, they constantly say, oh, the only thing that's constant in history is how little people learn from their history. No, you can absolutely learn from your history. You can save everything that our ancestors worked so hard to provide to us. But you must first know the facts about your history. And when you understand the facts about your history, which have been so falsified that you live in a matrix of leftist propaganda rather than any basic empirical facts. Once you understand your history, we can, we might have the possibility with this technology, this new Gutenberg press of the internet, we might have the chance of stopping the 10 generation cycle of empire, cycle of civilization in its tracks. We might be able to pile up enough facts, reason, evidence and knowledge and courage that we can stop the giant grim stone wheel of history from crushing yet another civilization as it seems poised to do with the West. Well now, who's ready to stop history? So we're gonna go through Stefan's video and examine what he claims are the parallels to the modern Western world. And as I said, his video is two and a half hours long. So for sanity's sake, I've decided to cut a lot for time and just focus on a few specific areas, otherwise we'll be here all day. But just so you can be sure I'm not misrepresenting Stefan's arguments here, I'd encourage you all to go and watch Stefan's video. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Uh, okay, let's move on to our first section. Now in 58 BC, as we said, Rome began distributing free grain, and this brought huge numbers of the rural poor into Rome. There was, the, again, with ever this mass kind of movement, there's a push and there's a pull. The pull was that there was free grain. The push was the massive influx of slaves from the empire that the uh, rural poor could not compete with. Now, by the reign of Julius Caesar, 320,000 people were on this uh, welfare dole. Now, the expansion of the dole of the welfare state drove steep rises in Roman taxes. And um, if you're a citizen farmer and you can't compete with all this slave labor, right, I mean, then you have a big problem. You end up leaving your farm, going to the city and living on welfare. They were a burden on the state. And what did they have to do with their time? Well, not much, except cause trouble and contribute to an ever-increasing crime rate. Huh. Now, that, that's got to be just a coincidence. And, um... and this sort of one-to-one -one comparison is the standard for the rest of Stefan's video. The displaced Roman farmers become the modern urban poor, our Western democratic governments become the Roman Empire, modern immigrants into the West are cast as both the cheap Roman slave labour and later on, the invading barbarian tribes. So here, he's comparing Rome's grain dole to our modern idea of the welfare state and citing it as one of the reasons that the empire fell. And now I hate to start this section off with such a minor point, but see here where Stefan writes, the conquests of the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC brought so many slaves into the empire, well, that doesn't really make sense, because the empire didn't exist at that point, and it didn't exist until Augustus a few hundred years later. What Stefan means to say is, slaves were brought into the Republic, not the empire. Now, I'm not suggesting Stefan was trying to mislead anyone with this. He later writes Republic in this section, even. So I think saying Empire here was just an honest error. I'm only highlighting it here because it's an indicator of the enormous length of time that Stefan is compressing. So 
History lesson time. Before Rome straight grain old, there was a grain subsidy, which was one of the reforms brought about under the tribuneships of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. And they were two Roman politicians who tried to address the economic inequality brought about by slavery, forcing all the poorer farmers into unemployment. And Gaius Gracchus passed a grain law in 123 BC that set aside a certain amount of state grain to be distributed to the poor at a reduced cost. And this subsidised grain eventually became free grain in 58 BC, which was about 500 years before the Western Empire fell, and indeed about 30 years before the Roman Empire even existed. So if the grain dole was one of the reasons the Empire fell, it took kind of a long time to kick in. And I'd like to hear Stefan's solution to this apparent grain dole problem. Earlier he says, the answers are obvious, but political correctness prevents us from talking about them. Whatever that means. Stopping the grain dole would mean food riots and starvation in the capital at best. It's not like those people could just go and get jobs, you know, slaves had all the jobs. Really, the grain dole was a sensible state expenditure that you know, beyond it being generally quite nice to feed the hungry if you're able to, it was necessary to prevent the poor from getting their torches and pitchforks out. But Stefan doesn't like state expenditures in general, not even sensible ones. But it wasn't just the Roman army, entire layers of bureaucracy grew. Uh, you know, like how we have uh, national governments in Europe, and then we have the additional layer of the European Union, I guess except for <laughs> the United Kingdom recently. So originally it was just like Rome, province, city. Boom. One, two, three. That was it. By the time of Diocletian, 284 to 305 AD, there were four emperors, four imperial courts, four praetorian guards, four palaces, etc. Kind of a lot of overhead. So let's talk about Diocletian. Here, Stefan is presenting the Tetrarchy, which is the common name for the time when Rome had four emperors, as an example of the growth of government bureaucracy. Now what he fails to mention is why the Tetrarchy was instituted. And since Diocletian's reforms are generally considered to have prevented the early collapse of the empire, I think this is worth exploring. So, history lesson time again. In the 3rd century AD, the Roman Empire went through what has been come to be known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century, which as you can probably guess, wasn't a terribly fun time for the Romans. There were invasions, plague, civil wars, assassinated emperors, the empire split into three separate empires for a while, it was... it was like Game of Thrones. Now the ascension of Diocletian and his following reforms typically mark the end of the crisis. He basically brought the empire back from the brink of collapse and stabilised it for a while, at least until he resigned, and yes, he resigned. He was the Emperor of Rome, the most powerful man in the world, and he resigned and went to farm cabbages. So Diocletian was a pretty interesting guy all round. As long as you weren't Christian, anyway. And one of the more interesting reforms was the Tetrarchy, the rule of four. So let's talk about that. Now the Roman emperors, during the crisis of the 3rd century, had a few relevant problems here. First was the succession of emperors, the transfer of power from one to another, quite often his assassin, was usually a very dangerous time. Next was the size of the empire, which made it extremely difficult for one man to rule by himself. He couldn't be everywhere at once, and you don't want to get attacked on two fronts when it can take months for a message from one front to reach the other. And you don't want to give too many troops and too much power to any one of your generals in particular, because if they end up winning their battles, they might turn around and march on you, and kill you, and become the new emperor, because after all, that's probably how you got into power as well. And another problem here is Rome, the city. Rome was not, as it turns out, all that well situated, at least in certain circumstances. You know, an emperor based in Rome is going to take a very long time to reach and respond to anything of note happening near the borders of his empire. Now, Diocletian's response to these problems was first to appoint a co-emperor, and later they each appointed a junior emperor, and they divided their territory thusly. Now, the result of this was that the empire was able to fight effectively on multiple fronts, with multiple leaders in regional capitals, 
who all had the ability to exert power with some level of autonomy. And there was a more formalised line of succession from junior to senior emperor. And at least while Diocletian was around, it worked. And yes, it was a massive increase in state bureaucracy, but it brought an end to the crisis of the 3rd century. Now, Stefan condenses all this history into one sentence about the growth of government, and this is really emblematic of his oversimplification of history in general. In Stefan's history, it goes, No grain dole, grain dole instituted, Rome collapses. One emperor, four emperors, Rome collapses. And this radical simplification of huge stretches of time is misleading, but it's necessary in order to make the sorts of comparisons to modern times Stefan is making. And now, at one point, Stefan offers a more direct contemporary comparison. As the parasites overwhelm the host, you have huge problems. So up to a third, about a third, of the uh, people in Rome at certain periods were dependent on the state for their survival. And as Mitt Romney pointed out, uh, I think it was in 2012, it's pretty hard for Republicans to get elected because uh, close to half of the American population rely on the state for all or significant portions of their income, so why would they vote for a shrinkage of the state? And now there's a lot of things wrong with this comparison. First of all, Stefan mentions it's difficult for the Republicans to get elected. And well, it was very difficult indeed for anyone to be elected emperor because they didn't have elections. But let's talk about Mitt Romney's 47% comments, and for those who haven't seen it, here is that leaked recording. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. These are people who pay no income tax. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. So our message of low taxes doesn't connect. And, uh, and so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. Now here's the problem. Mitt Romney was full of shit. He claims that this 47% of people will vote for the president no matter what. But if you look at the actual reasons as to why some of that 47% pay no federal income tax, that claim is quickly exposed as delusional. First off, a large part of that 47% are the elderly, who in one sense do depend on state welfare, but certainly did not exclusively vote for Barack Obama, believe it or not. And aside from the elderly, there's also the working poor, who, despite having a job, don't earn enough to pay federal income tax, and there's exemptions for things like households with young children, and notably, the rich don't pay federal income tax because they know how to avoid it. And they're certainly not voting overwhelmingly for Barack Obama either. And let's briefly address Stefan's point, where he says that it's hard to get people to vote for a contraction of the state when they're dependent on it. So we can infer from that that he thinks the Republicans are for contracting the state and reducing spending. And I know they say they're for that, but the most recent Republican president, George W. Bush, oversaw an enormous percentage increase in government spending. Way more than Bill Clinton. Wars aren't cheap, it turns out. And if you're for reducing state spending, then the recent history of the Republican Party should turn you right off. Anyway, let's get back to Rome and move on to our next section. So we're going to start off this section by looking at a quote about women from Stefan's conclusion to his video, and then we'll work backwards from that. Now, here's a quote. I put this out there for discussion. I have not um, figured out all of my perspectives on this. I put this out for our discussion, and we'll put the source to this below. An increase in the influence of women in public life has often been associated with national decline. The later Romans complained that although Rome ruled the world, women ruled Rome. In the 10th century, a similar tendency was observed in the Arab Empire, the women demanding admission to the professions hitherto monopolized by men. What, wrote the contemporary historian Ibn Bessan, have the professions of clerk, tax collector, or preacher to do with women? These occupations have always been limited to men alone. Many women practiced law, while others obtained posts as university professors. There was an agitation for the appointment of female judges, which, however, does not appear to have succeeded. Soon after this period, government and public order collapsed, and foreign invaders overran the country. 
The resulting increase in confusion and violence made it unsafe for women to move unescorted in the streets, with the result that this feminist movement collapsed. I leave you to ponder that one, and please let me know what you think in the comments. So there you go. Once women are given power, civilizations collapse. I've heard that one before. Uh, but it's okay, though. Stefan didn't really say that, of course. He just quoted someone else saying it. He just threw it out there totally randomly, just as a topic for discussion. Now, this tactic of sneakily hiding behind his source is especially funny here, because until that point, Stefan had, in his conclusion, been quoting almost verbatim from that same source, which is Sir John Glubb's The Fate of Empires, and let's take a look. Like out of nowhere, boom, some small group, kind of ignored beforehand, just explodes and grows and spreads. And this is sort of the, the pioneers as they're bursting out. And rather than virtue and action, there is this interminable engagement in intellectual debate. But these intellectual arguments, they rarely lead to any kind of agreement because... And um, it's kind of tragic, you know, way back in the day, you used to have just a very few number of elite intellectual uh, institutions, you know, Harvard and Cambridge and Oxford and so on. And now it's like every city, every town, every block, it sometimes seems that. So through this process of debate rather than action, there tends to be an intensification of hostilities in the political realm. There is uh, an influx of uh, foreigners, right? Because it's a wealthy region, Rome and, and Greece and, and the West, it's wealthy, so people want to get in. And so there's an end to sort of cultural or ethnic homogeneity. And we can just look at New York and just walk around the streets of New York and see how many descendants of the Pilgrim Fathers are around. The heroes of empires in seemingly terminal decline are always the same. You got your athlete, you got your singer, you got your pretty person, you got your actor. And so if we look at way back at Arab empires in Baghdad in the golden days of Harum al-Rashid, the uh, Arabs were actually a minority in the capital imperial city of Istanbul. And um, this is in the great days or in the significant or powerful days of Ottoman rule. Now, did you notice that he fucked that last one up? He accidentally read out two sentences as if they were one sentence. And as a result, he created a history Frankenstein's monster where Istanbul is somehow the capital of Baghdad. And Harun al-Rashid, who lived in the 700s, is now the leader of the Ottoman Empire somehow, which didn't even exist for another 500 years. So Stefan is about a thousand miles and five centuries out there. And that's the real problem with just reading things out to support your arguments without really understanding them. So anyway, after basically just straight up reading John Glubb's workout, when he gets to the section on women's rights, Stefan picks that point to be like, oh well, this is just a quote here, I'm quoting someone else, it's just food for thought, not my opinion. You know, he's trying to fly the anti-woman part of the argument under the radar there. So what does Stefan himself actually think about women? And this is taken from his video entitled the matriarchal lineage of corruption. Women who choose the assholes will fucking end this race. They will fucking end this human race if we don't start holding them a fucking countable. Women who choose assholes guarantee child abuse. Women who choose assholes guarantee criminality sociopathy, politicians, all the cold-hearted jerks who run the world came out of the vaginas of women who married assholes. And I don't know how to make the world a better place without holding women accountable for choosing assholes. If asshole wasn't a great reproductive strategy, it would have been gone long ago. Women keep that black bastard flame alive. They cup their hands around it. They protect it with their bodies. They keep the evil of the species going by continually choosing these guys. If being an asshole didn't get women, there would be no assholes left. If women chose nice guys over assholes, we would have a glorious and peaceful world in one generation. 
So, women are the root of all evil and will end the human race, apparently. And I have a question, like, why is everything so cataclysmic with these alt-right people? You know, women won't go out with, quote, nice guys, so the human race is facing annihilation, apparently. Why does every problem have to be an extinction-level event? I saw some guy recently say that Black Lives Matter will end Western civilization. Yeah, Black Lives Matter. You know, we survived the Napoleonic Wars, and the breakup of the empires, and the rise of Nazism, but, you know, some black people who are annoyed about police shooting at them, well, that's game over for Western civilization. Anyway, uh, with regards to Rome, Stefan does think women are somewhat responsible for the fall of the city, because they just weren't having enough babies, you see. And there's strong evidence of a steady decline in population across the entire empire from the second century CE on. And, um... By the 500s, there were only 6,000 people left in Rome by a 1,000. Uh, and um, why this fairly drastic reduction in population occurred, well, nobody knows for sure. Though the sort of luxurious lifestyle and the fact that a lot of women became less interested in producing and raising children um, certainly played some part in that. So then, the depopulation of the city of Rome. Stefan says no one knows for sure why it happened, which isn't true, but that loosening of women's morality played a part. So Stefan quotes the low population of the city of Rome by the time of the 500s. And now, I'd say that, as well as the aforementioned plagues, uh, the sack of Rome in 410 by the Visigoths, and the sack of Rome in 455 by the Vandals, probably had more to do with the population decline than the lifestyles of the Roman women. But the real truth here is that the importance of the city of Rome had been waning for a very long time before that. Stefan doesn't mention it here, but by the time Rome was sacked by the Visigoths, it wasn't the capital of the Western Empire anymore, and it hadn't been the capital for at least a hundred years. In 286, Diocletian moved the capital from Rome to Milan, and it was later moved to Ravenna, and it's the fall of Ravenna in 476 that is typically marked by historians as the end of the Western Roman Empire. Stefan really seems to have the blinders on when it comes to women's rights. Uh, let's take a look at another time he quotes a source talking about women. So by the late Republic, a rich wife who could divorce and take her wealth with her had a real threat against her husband and could wield influence over him. This increasing female power manifested in escalating sexual promiscuity and adultery. And I guess the modern equivalent would be, I'm going to drag you through the family court system, and um, that's how I'm going to have power over you, and so I'm going to be more uh, bullying. And one historian wrote, Roman men deplored the fact that these rich women were more concerned with their own figures and luxuries than with their families. Unlike the good old-time matrons, according to the historian Tacitus, around 100 CE, these modern women did not spend time with their children and did not nurse their infants, but left them to slave wet nurses. Furthermore, children were handed over to be raised by childminders, usually the most useless slaves of the household. Now, I worked in a daycare, and there were some nice people there, but a lot of them are kind of like minimum wage people and so on. They would be uh, the least economically productive or valuable people to have raise your children. So that quote there is from Family Values in Ancient Rome by Richard Sala, and is some excellent selective quoting by Stefan. Now, first of all, all this text on the screen right here came from the article by Richard Sala, so I don't know why Stefan singles out the last section by saying one historian wrote and putting quotation marks around it, because that one historian also wrote all of these sections as well. But whatever Stefan's motivation for doing that, if we read this article by Sala in its entirety, we see what Stefan chose to leave out. And the two sentences preceding Stefan's quotes here read as follows. The Romans had their own evolutionary story about family mores, and it had nothing to do with the invention of affection which they took to be natural and eternal in the family. However, their story did contain elements of the decline of paternal authority and the stable family. Emphasis on the word story there. And then Salah goes on to write everything that Stefan quotes in this video. Now, it's clear that Salah's presenting what Roman authors thought of family values in ancient Rome, not what those family values actually were. 
And this is made all the more obvious when later Salah goes on to write. What is interesting about these earliest Latin authors is that they are already deploring the moral decline of their own time. In short, the earliest Latin authors were already writing of the breakdown of the good orderly family in which the paterfamilias maintained authority over his wife and children. If there was ever a better age before the decline, it must have been in the prehistoric era. An alternative interpretation, one that I lean towards, is that the golden age before the moral decline never existed in reality but was a later invention by Roman authors who certainly had no reliable historical evidence for moral trends. That is to say, the narrative of moral decline of the family was based on a historical mirage of a better past and it was no more than a mirage. So then, a question. What is it with these alt-right guys and not reading their own sources? I'd say about half the time I go and check a source, it says the opposite of what they say it does, and I really can't tell to what degree they're willfully misrepresenting the sources here, you know. I don't know if it's scarier if they know they're lying, or if they think they're telling the truth. It's either incompetence or malice, and I can't tell which, so thoughts in the comments, please. Now, Stefan does mention at least one form of moral decline that doesn't have anything to do with women. Let's take a look. And Greece, in its own decline, just collapsed or decayed, I guess you could say, into a pretty lawless and disreputable nation. And then they were conquered by the Romans, 146 BC, uh, because they had uh, decayed and had become selfish and had become lazy and become ridiculously self-critical at the same time as there was these ridiculously high levels of hedonism. And... Um, they then were conquered from outside, and there's this grim cycle, which we'll talk more uh, in just a moment. It was, um, it was a very decadent and brutal society, right? The, the Colosseum would, would get so soaked with blood during the battles in there, the gladiatorial battles, that they would shovel new sand on the blood, hoping to soak it up so it wasn't too unstable for the next round of fighters. 383 AD, captive barbarians were being fed to wild animals in the Colosseum, and that is not good. So that's Rome's moral decay as represented by the violence of the Colosseum. And there's two main problems with this picture. The first is that Rome had been doing horrible things to people in arenas for centuries before the date Stefan mentioned. We can look at Suetonius talking about Caligula, who was only the third emperor of Rome, feeding prisoners to wild beasts without a trial. Now Christians, particularly during the times when Christianity was persecuted in the empire, didn't much like the practice of people being fed to animals in arenas, for obvious reasons. And that matters because in the early 4th century, Emperor Constantine came to power, and he was the first Christian emperor. And a relevant law of Constantine's is quoted in the Codex Theodosianus, which was a 5th century compilation of all the edicts and laws issued under Christian emperors. And I quote, Bloody spectacles are not suitable for civil ease and domestic quiet. Wherefore, since we have prescribed gladiators, those who have been accustomed to be sentenced to such work as punishment for their crimes, you should cause to serve in the mines, so that they may be punished without shedding their blood. Constantine Augustus. Now, not that this actually put an immediate stop to gladiatorial combat or anything, but the more violent arena events did generally decline under a succession of Christian emperors, coinciding, oddly enough, with the latter days of the Western Empire. And if I were to play devil's advocate here, I could say that these reformers trying to ban gladiator fights were an early example of liberal, PC, social justice types who were so pathologically altruistic that they were willing to undermine the centuries-old masculine tradition of gladiatorial combat. The decline of the arena shows an erosion of masculine Roman culture right before the fall of the empire, blah blah blah. And that's the ideologue's approach to history right there. It doesn't matter what actually happened, just spin it to support your position regardless. And one more point on moral decay here. There's a Roman legend of the first generation of Romans called the kidnapping of the Sabine women. And as the Romans tell it, the first generation of Romans were mostly men, and they didn't have enough women to establish enough families. So what they did was, 
They announced a huge festival and invited people from all the nearby towns to attend, and then at a signal from Romulus, the Romans grabbed all the women, fought off the men, and ran away. And that's a classic comic caper right there, but absolutely horrific if you actually think through any of the particulars. So why am I telling you about the kidnapping of the Sabine women? Well, my point here is that the early Romans weren't always moral and virtuous. If morality has one constant throughout history, it's that the preceding generation views the next generation as the worst, most immoral lot yet. But that doesn't make it true. So let's talk about something a little more concrete than concepts of morality and virtue. Now, this is the mind-blowing aspect of it. Just, just put this into your cogitator and take it for a hamster wheel spin. For all of this peace, all of this amazing public infrastructure, these roads, the astonishing roads that were really the backbone of the army's strength, the, the legal system, the, the, the soldiers, the, 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 the courts, everything. For all of this, the ordinary Roman citizen worked for only two days a year to pay his taxes. Let me say it again, brothers and sisters. The ordinary Roman citizen worked for only two days a year to pay his taxes. Okay, a little bit more at the end, which we'll get to, but just think of that. Just think of that. So then, the average Roman citizen paid his taxes by working only two days a year. And man, I hunted this source all over the internet, but I found it eventually a think. An American historian called J. Rufus Fears put out an audiobook called History of Freedom, and the two days a year thing comes from chapter 9 called Freedom in the Roman Empire. And I think it was from here that Stefan got it, because all of Stefan's other points in this section also come from this chapter of Fia's audiobook. The Roman Empire of Titus stretched from the Isle of Britain all the way out to the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys of Iraq today, and from the North Sea to the sands of the Sahara. We remember the case of St. Paul when he is arrested and about to be beaten by a tribune. Uh, he says, you cannot beat me. It is against my rights as a Roman citizen. And the tribune says, I don't believe you. Paul pulls out his papers. How did you get to be a Roman citizen? I had to pay a bribe to get one. Because for this wealth and prosperity, this protection by a superb army, for this infrastructure of roads, the ordinary Roman works two days a year to pay his taxes. Now, J. Rufus Fears declines to show his workings here, so I can't actually be sure how he arrived at two days a year. And from listening to his audiobook, Fears also has a very clear modern political bias, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was fudging the numbers a little bit, to be honest, but I don't know. Now, there is a book in the reading list that came with the audiobook that contains the two days worth of tax thing, and that's entitled Preparing America's Foreign Policy for the 21st Century, and that's a collection of talks and discussions held at the University of Oklahoma in 1999 by a bunch of professors and foreign policy experts. And the two days quote is in a section called The Roman Experience, Commentary and Discussion, and that chapter is authored by J. Rufus Fears. Now, if this book's intended as a source, then that's quite funny to be honest, I like the audacity of just quoting yourself. But it might not be meant to be a source, I don't know. It might just be an instance of the professor putting his own book on the reading list, you know. Anyway, just for the sake of this argument, I'm gonna assume that the two days a year thing is true. So okay, the average Roman citizen pays his taxes in just two days of work. Well, the first thing to note here is the phrase average citizen is not the same as average inhabitant. The Roman understanding of the word citizen is not the same as ours. Not everyone in the empire was a citizen. Rome was a slave state for starters, and slaves were considered property, not citizens. Actually, before the Edict of Caracalla in 212 AD, pretty much only free Roman men born on the Italian peninsula were considered full citizens. 
inhabitants of the other provinces of the empire were not full citizens. And this is significant because Italy itself was largely exempt from taxation until Diocletian's tax reforms in 290 AD. So to be a full Roman citizen before both the Edict of Caracalla and Diocletian's reforms means that you're not likely to be paying taxes anyway. And so we have to ask, what period of time is Stefan talking about? Stefan says taxes were paid in two days of work except for an increase near the end of the empire, and wouldn't that be narratively convenient? Well, the section of Fear's audiobook the quote comes from is talking about an average day in the life of a citizen of Pompeii. And Pompeii was destroyed in 79 AD, so we're necessarily talking earlier than that. Relatively early empire, and long before the Edict of Caracalla. Meaning most full Roman citizens at this point were exempt from most taxes, so it's not surprising they were quite low, to be honest. And I'm very interested if Stefan thinks this system would work today. Imagine President Trump comes to office and... He says, okay everyone, all American citizens are now exempt from taxation. Except, uh, from now on, only white men who were born here uh, count as citizens. And also, we're bringing slavery back. And by the way, I've just declared war on Canada so that we can go and steal all of their things and get more slaves. I imagine there'd be somewhat of a mixed reaction. Also, I'm reminded of Stefan talking about the grain dole. Now, the expansion of the dole of the welfare state drove steep rises in Roman taxes. But how does this work in Stefan's world? I mean, the grain dole was brought in before Pompeii was destroyed, and it didn't go away or anything. The grain dole was around throughout this whole period, so... Stefan at one point makes it seem like the citizens of Rome were struggling under the heavy tax burden of paying for the welfare of all the lazy scroungers, while at another point making it seem like the Romans were paying almost no taxes and enjoying economic freedom and growth. You know, which is it? It can't be both. And I'd like now to consider one point in Stefan's video where he either ignores or just fails to mention a contradiction in his argument even when it's staring him right in the face. Octavian took the name Augustus and became the first emperor of Rome, ruling from 27 BC to 14 AD. Now, this did shrink some political freedom, you know, he's an emperor, uh, but it did lead to an expansion of economic freedoms. So Augustus did favor private enterprise, private property, and free trade. So that's, that's good for merchants, at least, and for the general population who care more about bread than votes. So, under Augustus, taxes were lowered significantly. He abolished tax farming, which was this practice of just saying to people, go get me a bunch of taxes, and if you can't get them, you have to pay me anyway. And he regulated taxation as a whole. So, Trumpish <laughs> could be made the case. So, Stefan says that Augustus favoured private enterprise and free trade. But then he immediately gives an example of Augustus doing something which could very much be seen as the opposite of those things. So tax farming was the way that Rome collected taxes until Augustus's reforms. And what would happen is the state would auction off the rights to tax particular areas to private individuals, and then that private individual would be responsible for taxing the area. And as you might imagine, it tended to be abused by people looking to maximise profit. And Augustus abolished this practice and regulated the tax system, which resulted, as Stefan points out, in lower taxes. So, could one not argue that this is an example of the state interfering with and imposing restrictions on the free market? Augustus abolished the right to trade tax farming rights and brought tax under the regulation of the state. So couldn't it be said that it was the free market that led to the unfairly high taxes, and the state bureaucracy that lowered them? A point of comparison here is Augustus's creation of an institutionalised police force and fire brigade. Before Augustus, Rome's fire brigades were owned privately, and this is a bust of Marcus Licinius Crassus which is a hell of a name to say if you have a lisp, by the way, who was the owner of such a privatised fire brigade, and not so coincidentally, one of the richest men in human history. 
You see, when there was a fire in Rome, Crassus would have his fire brigade turn up and then do nothing while Crassus argued prices with the owner of the burning property. And if they didn't agree to pay Crassus what he wanted, he'd just leave and take his fire brigade with him. And that's obviously not a very reliable or safe system of firefighting. And so Augustus instituted a public fire brigade, and he actually levied a new tax on the sale of slaves in order to set it up. What a tax and spend, anti-free market socialist, one might say. Also, while we're looking at this section of Stefan's video, let's just, for a laugh, check out this source here. The historian Oertel wrote in 1934, quote, The victory of Augustus and of the West meant a repulse of the tendencies towards state capitalism and state socialism, which might have come to fruition had Anthony and Cleopatra been victorious, right? So in that war, uh, if the central planning of Egypt had spread to Rome, it would have been a disaster, uh, and it didn't spread the other way because Rome was the, sorry, Egypt was like the basket case for the Roman grain. So first off, as we know by now, the importation of post-industrial revolution ideas like socialism and capitalism into the ancient world is misleading and annoying. But let's check out this Oertel guy. So Stefan is quoting here from a Cato Institute article called How Excessive Government Killed Ancient Rome. And a more cynical man than me might suspect that an article by a libertarian think tank talking about the evils of excessive government might just be a tiny bit biased. But far-fetched speculation aside, uh, the article includes two sources for its quotes by Oertel, and that's chapter 10 and chapter 12 of the Cambridge Ancient History, published in 1934 and 1939. And when I saw that I thought, oh, that's quite a long time ago, I wonder if there are any more recent editions of those books, and would you believe it? Yes, there are. But I just want to detour a little before we get to those and mention Michael Rostovzev. Better said that wrong. Who is another historian quoted by both the Cato Institute and Stefan. And he's someone else who compared his contemporary political situation to ancient Rome, and funnily enough, whose Wikipedia article says, Rostovzev used terms such as proletariat, bourgeoisie, and capitalism freely in his work, and the importation of those terms into a description of the ancient world, where they did not necessarily apply, caused criticism. So then, do you have those two names? Right, so let's look at the updated version of Cambridge Ancient History. And firstly, the newer edition of Volume 10, published in 1996, says... It is probably true that there is no period in Roman history on which the views of modern scholars have been more radically transformed in the last six decades. It's therefore appropriate to indicate briefly in what respects this volume differs most significantly, etc. You get the point, the volume has been heavily revised. And it goes on to outline the reasons for the changes in perspective and then the revisions themselves. And one of these revisions was to just drop Oertel's contribution entirely, saying basically that it was interesting in its day, but it no longer holds up. Now then, the new edition of volume 12, and this volume is openly critical of both Rostovzev and Oertel's tactic of comparing contemporary politics to the ancient world. And here's a quote taken from the introduction to the section where it first mentions Oertel. In a rather loose way, modern bourgeois ideology, bourgeois? Bourgeois, I can never say that. Ideology has thought it possible to identify the present day bourgeoisie with the curiales and has taken up their cause against the despotism of a totalitarian imperial state. This is a singularly anachronistic projection of contemporary realities. So, what's my point here? Well, the Cato Institute and by proxy Stefan are selectively quoting older editions of the Cambridge Ancient History from the 1930s and ignoring the more recent editions that take a contrary and critical view of those earlier editions. But hey, I guess if you want to stop the wheel of history, you also have to stop historical research. Let's look at one of the times that Rostovzev shows up in Stefan's video, and I'm going to show you two clips now, both concerning historian Edward Gibbon. Gibbon, uh, one of the famous historians who really knew the history of Rome and, you know, turned his hands into <laughs> arthritic claws uh, writing all this stuff out, 
He wrote once, he said, that if a person were to pick the one period in the history of the human race when mankind was happiest, he would, without hesitation, choose that period of the second century AD, when Rome was stable, when peace reigned, and trade reigned throughout the empire. Trade was constantly rising and falling as empires rose and fall. And that is really, really uh, astonishing um, to think about. Michael Rostovsevs has described this as a period of, quote, almost complete freedom for trade and of splendid opportunities for private initiative. And um, this is one of the reasons why, earlier Gibbon said, this was uh, some of the best places uh, to live ever. Two days a year, pay your taxes, 5% on customs duties, which means locally produced goods. There's no tax, no duties, no nothing at all. Uh, and it's just astounding. So firstly, this quote of Rostovsev's is specifically talking about the reign of Augustus and his immediate successors. The time Gibbon identified as the best time to live was under the reign of the so-called Five Good Emperors, which was a century later. So let's read Gibbon's actual quote. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. And he goes on to mention the civil administration and the laws and the relative peace. Nowhere here does Gibbon say anything about free trade or the economy or anything, but he does mention the absolute power wielded by the state as a positive, which I wouldn't think Stefan would be too keen on, to be perfectly honest. So I'd like to wrap up my video by responding to a few key moments from Stefan's conclusion to his video. And the last thing that I want to say is that people complain, I mentioned this at the beginning, or people complain, they say, well, nobody learns anything from history. Well, it's like because nobody tells the truth about history. So what has happened is the history of the West in particular, uh, the, the glories, the triumphs, and the disasters the full span, of the Shakespearean span of Western history, has been replaced by vituperative calumny and nagging. Your ancestors were bad, your ancestors were mean, they were sexist, they were patriarchs, they were racist, they were homophobes, they were bad, bad, bad. Colonialism was just terrible, terrible, terrible. They slaughtered all the natives and all, right? The truth is that the West has brought by far the greatest values to the world. The values of science, the values of reason, the values of the free market, the values of modern medicine, the values of capitalism. You are the offspring and the descendants of many heroes, of many brave souls, who fought very hard to bring and extend the freedoms you now enjoy. If you feel that you are descended from evil, you have nothing in your civilization to defend. You are children of heroes and only heroes get to keep their freedoms oh stefan <coughs> so included there is stefan saying that nobody tells the truth about history but what is the truth about history according to him truth for molyneux appears to be whatever historical facts conform to his narrative and everything else is just to quote him interminable engagement in intellectual debate. Stefan also says that unless you think you're descended from heroes, you have nothing to defend about your civilization. And that's just not true. I don't think I'm descended from heroes, and I'll fully admit all the horrible things my society's done in the past, but I'm still proud of things about my society. You know, specifically here, that I have the freedom to admit that my society's done those awful things. The things I want to defend about my society are all the things that Stefan Molyneux would take away if he had the chance. You know, the fall of Western civilization for me would be the reinstitution of slavery, the taking away of women's rights, and things like that. I don't like this ultra-nationalist idea where you have to ignore all the bad things your culture or race has ever done. You know, what does Stefan think happened to the Native American societies? I don't know, I guess their taxes must have been too high or something. Oh god. No. I'm not doing it. 
I'm not watching it. I'm all Molyneux out for a good six months, at least. If you enjoyed this interminable intellectual debate, please like and subscribe. I know what they do now, I think. Um, I've also got a donation link on the YouTube banner there, if you're feeling particularly generous, and I've had quite a few donations of some very lovely people whose names I won't read out, because I don't know if they want me to, to be honest. But you know who you are, and you are very much appreciated. Also, if you'd like me to take a look at any specific video, hit me up on either Twitter or AskFM, and there will be links to those in the description. And look at me doing the proper YouTuber ending to the video, rather than just cutting away mid-sentence. I'm... learning. Next I have to figure out motion graphics.